So this is the bad one right here, poison ivy. This is the one everyone wants to avoid and everybody's always heard of. Leaves are three, let it be. It couldn't be more true. There's lots of plants, however, in the bush, especially in early stages of growth that have three leaves. So the question is, how do you tell them apart? Because not all plants with three leaves are necessary with poison ivy, although it's safe to assume if it does, you probably shouldn't touch it. But most people want to uh, reach a new level in their plant identifying. That's why you're probably watching this video. So how you're going to tell a poison ivy plant from other plants with three leaves, like a sarsaparilla plant or a young sapling just starting off, is the poison ivy plant, as you can see, always has a longer stem in the middle leaf from the other two beside it. So the two leaves beside it kind of mirror each other. They're symmetrical. The left and right leaves, they're symmetrical. The one in the middle sticks out farther from the center axis due to that uh, stem in the center. Every single poison ivy plant will have this. It's fairly unreliable to judge by the shape of the leaves themselves because the leaves can take on many shapes. I've seen ones that are triangular and uh, color especially. Sometimes they're red depending on the growing season. If they're just starting off or it's uh, late into the fall, the leaves may be bright red and shiny. The leaves may be pale green, dull. They may be uh, shiny green. They may be serrated, they may not be serrated. So the shape of the leaves themselves is uh, fairly unreliable when identifying this plant. It's the, uh, the uh, arrangement of the leaves themselves and the fact that that middle longer stem is present that's gonna tell you whether or not this is poison ivy. Poison ivy tends to be a dullish white on the bottom side, but uh, very, uh, it's very seldomly are you gonna be able to see that unless you actually touch the plant. So one of the second identifying features of poison ivy, aside from the arrangement of the leaves, is the fact that no matter how big or small this plant seems to be, the leaves always come out of a woody, barky stem. At all stages of growth, the bottom stem, most of the ground, has a uh, woody, barky texture to it. And eventually at the top of that, they branch off to the fleshy, smooth, green stems. So if you see those leaf arrangements with this woody, barky stem, there's a good chance you're uh, looking at poison ivy. Not all plants have the white berries. In fact, I've seen patches where I haven't seen any plants with the white berries. And uh, if you do, though, there'll be a uh, white uh, arrangement tightly clustered together. And they'll be usually coming off of the uh, center branch here. That's how this plant reproduces is from its berries. This patch in particular has completely covered the ditch. And uh, right down there, there's some growing up almost like a shumac tree out of this big massive bark. This plant can take on many forms, like a big massive shrub like that one staring me in the face down there in the ditch. Uh, they can grow up in a vine and completely take over a tree, almost like a Virginia creeper or a grape arrangement. Uh, and uh, they can be small, pathetic little shrubs growing into a rock cut, you know. So uh, this plant can grow pretty much anywhere in many different forms. Some very important facts about this plant that are worth noting is that the uh, toxic sap contained within poison ivy is called urushiol. It has a boiling point of 200 degrees Celsius or 392 degrees Fahrenheit. Burning poison ivy should be avoided at all costs because the urushiol will actually vaporize into the air. It can be inhaled or uh, cling to the surface of mucous membranes, which can be uh, extremely hazardous to your health. Inhalation can be fatal. Over 90% of the population uh, has an allergic reaction with poison ivy, and the uh, degree of reactivity varies from one person to the next. Some people may be immune to it at first and develop reactions over time with more and more contact with the plant, and uh, some people may be extremely allergic to it. The allergic reactions generally worsen over time with more contact with the plant. 
If you ever come into contact with poison ivy, you should wash your skin with soap and water as soon as possible. Time's of the essence here because the longer the uh, urushiol is left on your skin, the harder it will be to remove and the worse the rash will be. People who are affected by poison ivy don't necessarily have to come into contact with the plant. The plant's irritating oil can be transferred from one surface to another by unlucky individuals who happen to come into contact with it. And then it can be transferred to another person who come into contact with that object when the oily residue is still present. So the next plant I'm going to bring up is uh, I'm going to introduce you to the most toxic plant in North America. And uh, this is very relevant to bring up so you know exactly what this poisonous uh, plant looks like so you can separate it from all the other edible uh, medicinal plants in this family. If you get the bad ones out of the way first, then uh, it opens up a whole door of new things you can experience. So uh, this is the uh, water hemlock. It's uh, native to pretty much most of North America, Canada, United States. It's quite abundant anywhere there's standing or flowing water. And uh, it's caused a lot of fatalities because it's been mistaken for uh, edible plants in this family. And uh, it's growing right in pretty much open water. The grass is just covering it up. And uh, this plant can get almost nine feet tall. It's uh, quite large or it can be quite small depending where it is in the water source. I'm uh, five foot nine inches tall and this plant's got a good two feet on me. So they get quite large. Again, you get an idea, you know how big a half ton tailgate is. This plant's massive. Because this plant uh, of this size, that one root will be enough to kill you in probably 15 minutes to a half an hour. This, this root would be enough to kill a cow. So uh, there's plenty enough there to do the job. So how do you identify this plant? Well, one of the best ways to do it is the leaf. It's good to identify a plant by the leaf if at all possible because it has leaves at all stages of its growth naturally and uh, it's only going to have flowers a small part of its life so don't rely on the flowers. So water hemlock has uh, leaves where the uh, veins here, try to get in on that. The veins in the leaf will come inside the notches and not out the tip of the serrated leaf. So if you can see what I'm talking about, you see those veins into the indent of the notch, not out to the tip of it. And this is the only plant in this whole species of plant that does that. So if you see this, uh, key characteristics you've got to uh, water hemlock. So as far as the leaves are concerned, besides the uh, key feature I pointed out before about the veins of the leaf going into the notch that tells you this is water hemlock, the arrangement of the leaves is also another sign that uh, this is water hemlock and not water parsnip which is totally edible. Water hemlock has a leaf arrangement that uh, consists of compound leaves side by side each other, but uh, they branch out numerous times and they're not just one uh, straight branch with compound leaves like water parsnip. As you can see, this main stem comes up, splits off into two more stems, and then splits off into two more stems, arrangements of compound leaves. If this were water parsnip, this main branch would have compound leaves all the way up it on the one branch and that's it. It wouldn't split off into a haphazard shape of more and more compound leaves. So the stem of this plant is hairless and at the base of most of the uh, branching off sections it's got purple streaks. It's uh, often re referred to as spotted water hemlock, this variety. It uh, is native to Ontario and most of Canada. Sometimes it will have a uh, white powder that rubs off and it's hairless. So I should point out that these flower umbels, they're not one big solid round umbel 
like uh, you'll see in a wild carrot or many other edible plants. And the valerian, uh, it's also a solid white flower bract. The hemlock has a flower bract made up of many smaller, evenly spaced out flower bracts. So you can spot this feature quite a ways away. So here's the root of this plant. This root has a uh, section of hollowed out chambers that progressively get smaller as they approach the bottom of the root. And uh, the main tap root contains this oil that upon contact with oxygen turns to a dark orange color. And this is the most toxic portion of this plant. And uh, th that oil is uh, the toxin. This root uh, smells strongly of carrots. It's a sweet, pleasant carrot odor. So uh, people uh, that rely on the sniff test, this can really uh, throw you for a loop. All parts of this plant are toxic. The most toxic part being the root, especially in the early spring when this plant is starting to grow because that's where everything is concentrated. Once the plant gets taller and uh, grows flowers, the parts uh, become less toxic. Although uh, any ingestion of this plant in any, any quantity will cause death in uh, 15 minutes to an hour from violent seizures and convulsions. Often uh, supportive measures are the only way to save a person's life because there's no cure for this toxin. So uh, artificial respiration and anti-seizure drugs are necessary along with hospitalization as soon as possible. If you ever suspect you've consumed a poison plant, then induce vomiting immediately because it's going to uh, get that out of your system. You want to avoid digesting it. I've read in places that uh, this plant is far less abundant than water parsnip. I strongly disagree with that because every time I spotted this species, I've never found water parsnip anywhere near it and I've always seen this a lot more often than water parsnip. So uh, for those reasons, I would completely avoid ingestion of this species or anything that looks similar to this. So here's a very small water hemlock that's just started to grow up. It uh, has no flower and it's only about a foot high at this point. Again, even at this stage of growth, I can identify it immediately by the veins entering the inward notch of the leaf.